Hi guys, welcome to the Offnode Labs next talk in the AI series. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, folks from ShareChat, Prishap uh, Parihar and Vikram Gupta. We'll be talking about multimodal content and Sorry, that was a direct uh, reverse feedback. Yeah, so thanks everybody for joining. We'll, we'll wait for some time for other people to join and, and then we will start. Um, so people who are not familiar with this interface, uh, hello Paritosh. Uh, uh, it, it's a uh, yeah, you can. Uh, there's a chat. There's a chat uh, board, and then there's a raised hand board. You can click on it. So, so the format is that we'll take questions on the fly, and and then periodically um, the speakers will be able to answer you. So, so feel free to put down your questions on the chat box, and uh, um, yeah, if you want to speak and ask a question. There's a raised hand chat box and, and where you can raise your hand and, and give you the mic. So that's the format. Uh, yeah, I normally introduce Offnote Labs. Some of you might be already f familiar with it. Some of, for some of you, Offnote Labs might be new. So here's a link to a video you can watch. It's, it's a short intro to Offnode Labs and what we do, and, and also this uh, AI talk series. You can watch the previous talks in the series on our YouTube channel. Sounds good. We'll wait for five more minutes and then, then we'll start. Okay, sounds good.
all right uh, again thanks everybody for joining this morning session on saturday uh, this is the next talk in the off note labs ai talk series uh, uh, we have folks from share chat uh, vikram gupta and rishabh parihar going to talk about multimodal content understanding uh, again I, if you are not familiar with the interface there is a chats box where you can type in your questions and we'll take them periodically and uh, if you want to speak and ask your question there is a raised hands uh, tab um, the the of note labs talk series we invite industry experts researchers and and builders who are passionate to share their learnings and experience with us and it's, it's sort of a blend of of traditional presentation and and podcast style conversations you'll see uh, questions on the fly and and discussions and typically our audience has been very technically engaged so it's it's a it gets very interesting as as people go deep into the topic and and, and try to understand things more deeply and we take delight in unraveling the experience of of doing research and innovation and that's part of the broader theme of of note labs so with that i'm very happy and excited to invite to have uh, vikram and rishabh as speakers today and talk about their their uh, their awesome work at share chat involving uh, understanding videos and text at a at a huge scale um so uh, so over to you vikram and rishabh um yeah okay guys you can hear me yes so, okay thank you nishan for the wonderful introduction and thank you guys for making out time on saturday morning it has been hard for me so i, I understand a lot of you might have taken extra care last night so uh, so let's keep it very very interactive right and it's a uh, we'll try to go into the research topics that we look at but before that we'll just you know give you some idea of what we do what are the main challenges that we face okay so some of you might know that you know share chat has two main apps one is the share chat app and other is the moj app and in the coming slides i'll just you know explain what these two apps do so the agenda for today will be an overview of the apps that we have then the two most important topic that we look at one is the content moderation where we try to uh, address trust and safety issues on our platform and the other is nearby recommendation engines so i'll explain what cold start problem is in the coming slides and then we have like few sections which will be very very interesting for all the folks here because here we'll talk about how we try to productionize these systems right so while you know in research and in papers you could very well do a lot of things but when you want to really put it in production you need to be very sure that they run at the scale you want them to run at moreover you can also understand that data becomes a very important part in production right and like research where your data sets are already curated here that is also an important factor to think about okay so before that just want to you know touch upon this point of bharat okay so uh, so what we call bharat here is in the context of the people who have joined internet recently so if you imagine somebody at your hometown or in a village you would realize that a lot of people have started using internet just like probably couple of years back <coughs> right and they are not too tech savvy yet but they have still because of the penetration of internet and mobile phones they are on the net now and there are some very peculiar characteristics of these folks right one is that they love to discuss things in their own language right so they are not english first user if you see i mean like my parents and all i mean they would speak to google alexa and everything in hindi and they will also type in hindi sometimes in whatsapp also right so the content that they prefer is not a english first content unlike lot of us here the other thing you could see and maybe sometimes we also you know smile at it is that the things they search for so while lot of us may not search for krishi darshan right i mean or farming but uh, that forms a very important part of lot of people's life in india similarly astrology religion some things you know these are not the things which typical for english first user will do on a day to day basis so we have to understand that these people have little different taste and different needs right the other thing is that they love simple things 
So this is not unique to Bharat users as such. Everybody will love simple things. But what is happening is that we as a user who have been on the internet for last 10 years, <coughs> what is simple for us may not be simple for others, right? If you see LinkedIn or if you see Facebook, if you see that you know triple uh, menu buttons there, a full dashboard comes up, right? There's so many options to take care of. But just think about it. I mean, do you think your parents would not be understanding all of it? No, right? So they would love to have something very simple wherein they can just come in and things automatically flow in the right direction. And that is where we feel that AI can help. So AI can, you know, push the right content to the users in a safe way without doing too much of operations, right? So you don't need to really follow people. You don't need to search for people. You don't need to have a lot of friends. It's just a very, very relevant content that comes automatically on your screen. That is what our, both our apps try to do. So the overall objective here is that we want our users to be able to discover content, which they can consume themselves as well as share it with others. We want them to have fun. We don't want it to be a boring app where, you know, it's just about content information. <coughs> it's also about fun. We want them to be informed. So we have a lot of news data over the our applications and we want to have them build some kind of community wherein they can meet with people with similar interest. So with these things, you know, we are trying to develop these applications, which are a little bit more focused for Bharat, like the first share chat app that I'll introduce and much the other app is more unique in that sense. It is very, very applicable universally. So what is share chat? This is the first app that I want to talk about. So this is exactly for the language first audience. So we see that the majority of people on share chat, they're not English users. They are mainly users in the other Indian languages. So here you can come, you can share content, you can discover new content and you can form communities here. So currently I just want to uh, say that you have, we have around 50 languages here and we have around 30 minutes that users are spending every single day. So that's a very, very phenomenal number for us that 30 minutes of their day people are giving us. And that makes us more responsible towards giving them the right content. Our monthly active users is around 160 million plus now. So the app is doing pretty good and we are receiving around 2.5 million up content pieces every day. So a lot of content is getting created. A lot of content is getting uh, consumed by the users on this app. So the other app that we have is the Moj app. So this is a short video app. So here you can only upload videos and these small videos can be consumed and they have their own categories. So we would like you to see these videos and serve them in the right way so that all the interesting video comes to you. So here also, if you see, I mean, we just launched it a few months back and we already have 80 million plus MAU over this and 2 billion plus videos have been playing every day. So imagine the kind of interaction that people are having. And these are pretty fun videos. I mean, just play one for you. And, uh, you know, Gangu Chan thi, aur chan thi right? So it's just some fun content, right? So it's not a very, very utility based thing. It's more to for your enjoyment, but we're trying to make it as useful for you as possible, right? So these two apps form, let's say the pillar of share chat currently, and we are trying to make them better every day. So one of the biggest difference I think we have tried to create here is that we have tried to move from connection oriented to AI first feeds. Okay. So I think the figure that you're seeing right now, okay, so this is a typical figure, which a lot of social media apps use, wherein you have to add people in your network. Once enough people are added to your network, you start getting good number of feeds, a good number of videos. Okay. And they are relevant to you. So in this, what happens, the AI comes in and it starts improving the overall experience, right? Something like Facebook, right? But what we do at ShareChat is from the connection oriented, we have moved to AI first. So the idea is that maybe you do not need to add anybody. Maybe you can just come on the platform. We start showing you some videos and after a few views, we'll judge what you want to look at and then start recommending similar things. That is how our apps work. So when you add, there is no inertia of, you know, finding people to be added. So what this does is this solves two important purposes. First is, you know, connecting people takes time, right? 
So if you are let's say introvert person, you will not be able to really do so well on maybe Facebook. You will not be able to add enough people. You will not be able to follow enough people, and you will just get bored and out of the network. The other thing you see is from the people who are creating content. So what happens is in Facebook and all that, uh, since you have added people you know, anybody who you do not know, his content never comes to you. <coughs> so what happens? You lose out on lot of nice data. right so let's say your friends are all philosophers right and you are interested in cricket now if you just keep following those philosophers like i do a lot of researchers so i find my whole field with cvtr papers and i have none right in this year so so what happens it gets very very boring at times so at times what happens is the app should be able to do what i am trying to do right now not what my friends do and that is where this you know ai first feeds start helping us so it helps both the people in finding right content and it also helps people who are creating the content to reach the right person so this is a major shift in the understanding between the other uh, social media platforms and what we are trying to do so now so, so let me just in you know, and ask so the, the content that you get on moj is it different from what people used to post on on tiktok or is it more local or indian in some way yes yes, yes. so it is lot Lot of lot Indian actually, so it's the uh, format is similar. I would say there are short videos, but you can imagine that everybody is posting their own language, and the followers that they are getting is lot you know from their own state, awesome. their own region. So it's pretty interesting to see that kind of thing. And we also you know do sometimes this heat map across North, South, East, and West India, and we realize like how differently people are interacting with different content. Awesome. So different thing is famous in different area. So there are sort of local clusters that are emerging. Yes. yes. Yes, 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 and I think it depends on what festival is happening. Let's say when I- IPL started happening, and suddenly we saw a lot of cricket videos. So the trend keeps on changing. I mean, it's a very, very live kind of feed. So it's moving thing. Yeah. Just to remind everybody, there's a chat box where you can type in questions as we go into the top. And uh, yeah, if you want to raise your hand and ask, that's also awesome. yeah. In fact, I would love to. This is uh, uh, stop for a. For me, ten seconds. If somebody wants to ask already something, I mean, let's keep it interactive. I mean, otherwise, there's yeah. no fun. Yeah. So, a quick reminder that this is a is a virtual platform, and it's not the same as you know talking, having Vikram and Rishabh in front of you. But there's, but there's a slight push that's needed for you to you know start asking questions, and once people start, it's very interactive. So please go ahead and and, and throw your questions. Uh, small, big, anything. Okay, no worries. So I'll start. For, sure, you can continue. And, yeah, and then guys, you can just just ping me. Okay, like ping in the box, and we'll take it. Okay, so the main things that uh, form the important parts at Share Chat is one is recommendation system, right? So since we are an AI first company and we are not having this connection based thing, you can imagine that recommendation is the only thing that. Pushes one video after the other, so that forms an important part. The other important part is content moderation. So, guys, when you know when you open a dashboard or a platform to everybody, then you can understand a lot of people will you know start posting offensive content, and there will be a lot of fake news like what Twitter is facing right now. So, content moderation is very important given the environment that we are living in these days, right? And it's changing. Very drastically. Every other day, you see new laws coming up from the IT Ministry of India. Also, right? It's a ongoing topic. So that's why it's very important. The other is cold start problem in content streaming because recommendation systems don't really work so well when the you know content has not been shown to enough people. I'll go in detail in the coming slides on this. Other important thing is creator tools. So whoever is is posting videos on our platform, our creators, we want to help them create better. Videos, high quality videos, without doing too much of effort. Then we have operations team, which is very important because there's so much of content coming every day. We need a lot of people to understand it and moderate it. And then we have the AI platform and deployment. So, since you know, like two million posts are coming every day on March, so you have to do everything at scale. So we will also cover how we try to make this happen in a speed and latency point of view also. Right. So the first thing that we do content moderation. So as I explained, I mean, since a lot of data is coming, content moderation is very, very important. So at ShareChat, we internally call this as integrity violating content because it is, you know, not allowing us to really maintain a clean, safe environment for our users. 
yeah rohit i yeah. skip that question yeah i, I will we'll cover it after uh, explaining the content moderation okay. so uh, rohit is curious about uh, how accurate your ai has been for content yes moderation. and and we'll go into that yeah. yes we will we'll go we'll go into that so just explain the methods that we have and we'll explain that okay so so usually i mean there are few categories of uh, ivc content that we see i mean a lot of violence nudity gore engagement baits where people you know just give you that you know click here to do this click here that so so these are not actually good content right if you are on a platform like amaj or share chat you would not like to see all of this but the reason why people do this is because this gives them views right so all the sensational content usually gives more views so it solves the purpose of the user because he gets views and followership but it you know it does not serve the purpose we are not here to serve you this content right so we need to stop it right so we try to to one thing that we started initially was when we had less number of data points was that do some manual examination but this cannot work right because lot of posts so now we have developed algorithms which can work along with the human moderators in tandem so we have designed this you know some content moderation policies at share chat so there are three main policies one is proactive so what we do every video that comes in goes through a ivc classic detector so there is this model which is able to look at the data and see say whether it is uh, a bad content or a good content so if the model is very very sure sorry you use the term ivc yes yeah, yeah. so ivc is integrity violating content so we like all of this content we cover in one umbrella term so if the model says that this is definitely ivc we ban the prom- comment or we ban that post sometimes we also try to ban the whole profile if we see a lot of content coming from that <clears throat> but if the model is not very sure then what we do we pass it through a human moderation pipeline okay so it goes to an annotator or a ops team person who will look at it and tell you whether this is actually ivc or not so now so this also helps us as a annotation tool if you understand right so so what happens any tool with which model is not very sure that goes through now an automatic annotation process and next time when we train the model this data automatically feeds in the other approach that we take is reactive approach so any post that gets famous on the platform we definitely trigger this thing because virality is such a thing that you know it can happen for any ra- random thing also and so what we do like we wait for let's say 10000 views once those views come in we say okay let's get it checked why that is happening so if the content is good we let it pass otherwise we'll block it the third one is user triggered so we have this report abuse kind of options in the app so that is the third channel from which this can happen okay so i'll just take some questions here uh, Yeah. Pause a bit and yeah, yeah. people, please ask your questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the probably the high level uh, flow chart of of their IVF detection yeah. flow. Yeah, and then I, I believe they will get more get yeah. details. Yeah. So I'll try to answer first question. So Rohit, you asked about the accuracy. So so it's very interesting. Okay, <coughs> so this content accuracy. So we don't measure accuracy at times. Right, we measure a lot of times the recall. so the idea with ivc detection is that we do not want any post to get missed but we are very much okay if more candidates come in right so we don't want any post to be get missed because if that is missed then it goes into the platform and becomes maybe viral so we measure everything into recall now and our recall values i think rishab can point on the exact values here but and uh, rishab do you want to just take this yeah right so uh, we have recall values of more than 90 to 93 but again like uh, for remaining posts it also goes for manual review so uh, it doesn't happen any so if anything is missed by the model still we have some manual moderators that can uh, detect the post and remove from the platform yeah, thank you rishab so guys so basically it's a combination of all these three strategies that we are putting here because it's a very tough thing to do ivc detection right i mean it's very contextual so we try to do this and over a time we keep on measuring how many percentage of post we were able to capture so that helps us is knowing that whether we are capturing or not so let's say on some day if it is zero then definitely we have missed a lot of things okay and uh, then uh, whatever recommendation algorithm 
recommendation guys i think we uh, just we are not the probably the subject matter expert here so we will uh, talk in a different direction in the coming slides and for recommendation i think we can connect you with the right people who are developing recommendation so we have different verticals so we are from the content understanding vertical more than the recommendation part okay and rohit what happens when a celebrity with multiple follower posts some i see so guys we'll see if somebody report abuses then we definitely have a look and to be honest a celebrity would hardly do this right i mean can you imagine a popular person putting their reputation on stake no right so it happens very very occasionally and in those situations the post is we don't remove that account honestly in, so it's not that high penalized for a popular celebrity we will ask for a reason and then take it forward from there when you say model is not sure ayush asked do you mean to say model confidence so guys there are two ways right so when you say model is not sure one is the measurement of entropy right you can say if the entropy is high then the model is confused the other way of looking at it could be what is the probability of the best possible class so you can have a threshold you can say that if the maximum probability is above 0.9 then that is a measure of confidence right and the third thing could be you know people do this uh, ratio of top to probability so top one by top two so you see how much the top is better than the second one right and then i think all of you might also have heard about this uncertainty uh, paradigm which we have uh, not started yet but that is also another way of looking at these things so there are a lot of these things and it is a little bit empirical ish so if you ask me now what is the value that could work i mean it could be anything depending upon how your models are confident what kind of data you fed them with right so you have to do some calibration there Uh, recall meaning how many people have viewed? No, so recall does not. So, so in this context, when I said recall, it meant that if hundred IVC posts were uploaded on the platform, how many were we? How many of them we were able to bring? Basically, how many of them we were able to identify? Right. So, if you have a relaxed system, what it will do? It will miss some of the things. But in our system, what we say? We say okay, bring in more posts, but do not miss any IVC. And I just recall means total correct correlation. Uh, I wish I am not very clear about your next question. Uh, can you just type it again? I mean, a little bit more explanation. Yeah. Yadmesh, uh, what happens in the proactive part? Are there some models? Yes, we have to talk about the models in the next section. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, it might be a good idea to just read through all the questions and then maybe you can answer yeah. them together. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so about guys, I think about the uh, content moderation models. We'll just have we have lot of slides for that. We'll cover it in the next section. Exact models also. How has model been successful in training AI models in fifteen different languages? So I think guys, I think one of the major broad bottleneck is data, right? Most of the time, so it's no big deal to train fifteen. The big deal is getting the right content. And fortunately, I mean, we have so many users right now across different part of the, you know, place in the India that we are getting data across all the languages. So in that way, we are little. You can say fortunate. Like the data is not an issue for us. That's why we are able to train it. Yeah. But but I guess the challenge is is the labeled data. Yes. So and we have time for that. Yes. So we tell how we try to use unlabeled data. So we have a lot of unlabeled data. Let us wait for that. I think we should sure. cover it in more yeah. detail. Okay. So guys, I'll just move forward, and then again, I'll take the questions from this point onwards. Okay. Right. So, so in this slide, I just want to cover, like, you know, why off-the-shelf solutions do not work. So, Google has its own API for offensive content. Amazon has it. Right. So, we tried them actually. But what happens is that the policies, you know, what is an IVC content keeps on changing because as the platform is growing, we are seeing lot of different things, and as the laws are changing, it will also change. Right. Another important part is explainability. So, when we have our internal models, we are able to explain why this was an IVC content. So when you say IVC, we do not do yes or no. We also try to find out whether it was violence, gore, or what. So that way, once you explain it, you can tell your users also, right, that why this post was banned. Because our users are new, they are creating content, and they are not professional users, so they might not know why it got banned. So this also is important. Third part, what I think you guys have already recognized the problem now. So it's multi-model data. So not everybody does multi-model, and the kind of audio, video that people get is very different. Other thing, culture and geography, right? So, so a lot of movies, you know, which are probably adult in India, Indian context, or not adult in US context. So, what happens if you take their models? They may not generalize so well to your geography and your culture. 
other thing is creator pro <coughs> profiles so the people who create good content never do these kind of ivc violations so this is also an important thing if you take off the shelf solutions they would not be able to take the signals from your mm -hmm. own platform right and then we see people are finding new ways to game the system so people are trying to manipulate in such a way that it comes negative so we have to keep on you know having our own models which can improve over the course of time so that we can handle things well if we rely on any third party they will not be able to update with the kind of trends that we see okay other important problem i think which is very common among users in general including us maybe sometimes is that deduplication so any post that gets too many views people tend to instead of resharing they tend to download it and put it again from their own you know profile i think we all might have done it at some point on linkedin or facebook right we like something too much and then we write it from our site again instead of resharing it so what happens in this scenario is that this post because its quality was high gets spread across and the user starts seeing the same post multiple times right because this is the exact same video and since our recommendations are ai based both these videos will have very similar kind of response by the users so this is not a good user experience so we need to remove the duplicate post from our platform okay but uh, for that we extract the features from the post and then we have to do nearest neighbor search but the problem here is time complexity and space complexity right so when 2 million posts are coming every day in a month you can just see i mean how many posts we have and if i have to find out whether this post is duplicate or not i have to compare it with all of these embeddings right right so like for one day let's say you got 2 million post then your embedding size of let's say so 100 or 512 will be there and you have to compare with 200 2 million post every day so that is very very time and space complexity so and the other problem is that it will because of the time this duplicate post will spread in the network already by the time you recognize it is duplicate it will spread off <laughs> so that is why we try to use some of the software tools uh like milvers and fires so these tools are uh, give you gpu acceleration also and they help us in doing a very fast nearest neighbor search okay so just to give you some context like how can you speed up your search right so what you can do is you can cluster your embeddings so instead of having all the embeddings of all the post in one flat index you can make clusters and when a new post comes in you can see its distance with the centroid of a cluster and then do a deeper search into that cluster and then this hierarchy could go on depending upon how fast you want it to be the other way could be that you reduce the precision so instead of having floating point you can just have integers so now although your accuracy will be down but your search will be very fast so these tools inherently try to use these techniques to give us a very fast nearest neighbor search So I think anybody who has worked on clustering would know this, right? So if you, I give you 10 million images with ResNet features 2048, it's very difficult to cluster them. If you do k-means, it will take ages for a CPU to do it. And that's where these kind of things help us because they are very uh, fast in computing distances between the data points. Okay. The other issue is that actually the similarity between two embeddings matches the semantic similarity of the post with the image. So are you successful doing that are you going to talk about that more so yeah so this in this we are very very successful i mean so we have been because see what happens is that if the post is same then even if you take few frames out of it the embeddings will be exactly same right so it's not that tough a problem you are talking only about video right now you can you can concatenate audio video together well no and text Next all, so 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 when we are talking, we are just talking about one modality for concreteness. But you can imagine, you can just concatenate everything. So, so your higher level theme is that even if you remove part of the some sub part of the whatever mode it is, the the embedding will be yeah. really the same. Yes, and you don't face uh, you know like with text, there is this paraphrasing problem. The 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 text is not the same, but meaning is the same. Yeah, so you don't. Uh, You encounter less of that kind of problem. So we don't want to do that. So if you are expressing the same content in different language and you have made your own video, we are fine with it. So we want to only penalize exactly same upload. We want to avoid re-uploads. 
right? So it's not a paraphrasing or entailment problem. It's more of an exact match problem. That's why it becomes easier. But I understand, Nishantham, your point is very valid if you want to have similar videos. That is the whole problem that we face in recommendation. In recommendation, we would like to have the same paraphrased, uh, you know, text maybe mm -hmm. show shown to the user one after the other. Mm -hmm. But here the problem is a little different. Here is a major problem is a problem of scale. Okay. And the encodings, the neural architectures that encode these are standard. Mm -hmm. Yes, so for this we use very pretty standard ones. Yes, and we even quantize it. So we just use maybe like eight bit or something, and it's able to give us the exact duplicate for sure. Right. So, yeah. and this 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 is very important because this needs to happen very fast. Because once that post is shown to some people, so let's say if post is done today and you take one hour to find out if it is duplicate or not. By the time it would be so viral already, it would have already, you know, deteriorated the experience of a lot of users. Mm -hmm. so, so is there a pre-filtering uh, strategy before you post, pass it through some embeddings and match? Yes. It? yes, so as soon as the post comes in, our IVC pipeline, deduplication, these are like very, very, you know, sanity pipelines. I mean, they run first before anything happens. These have to finish, you know, within seconds. And then there could be some batch thing which can happen overnight also. And I guess then you have to talk about, or I don't know, you'll go you'll talk about the infrastructure yeah, that yeah. handles this at scale. You get two, yeah. I don't yeah. know how many posts per second and all of that has to be processed at a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we see even you know, normally in the morning, like 9 to 12, a lot of posts suddenly come in and evening 9 to 12, and which is understandable, right? I, so I don't understand the mornings, I understand the evenings. So somehow <laughs> some people do it in the morning. And I'm not sure. Maybe maybe this is their profession profession. So maybe they promise themselves that every day I'll do one post and that's why in the morning it happened. Yes. But evening is pretty obvious. So sounds good. There there are one or two questions. Oh yeah. sorry, there are more questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Scroll as freely I used to do. Yes. There are a couple of questions. So so maybe you can read through all the questions, you can decide to answer now or a later point. Yeah, so I think Shidam, I think you asked a very important question. Is it better to optimize precision? So, so the thing is, it depends on a policy, right? So do you, when you go for precision, you have a low recall, right? There's always this AUC curve and a, you know, a pros and cons there. We don't want any bad content on the platform. We are very much okay in stopping a good content, but not letting a bad content, right? So that is the choice we have taken. And since there is a manual thing also, so precision automatically goes high, right? So we do not, so we bring in more candidates and then subsample it using humans or using confidence value. So it works out that way. What step did you take to reduce the data usage? Yeah, data usage, I think uh, Rakhi, I'll probably try to answer a little later because that is a very, uh, uh, so can you just specify like, do you want to know in product sense or because this data is on servers and it gets pulled up when you want to look at it. So there's no, uh, and there's a lot of encoding, decoding of videos, of course. So I'm not sure if you're talking that direction, but just can you just rephrase the question? Let us know which direction you want to understand it from. And Siddhartha so have to. Yes, Siddhartha. So this uh, so that so duplicate can be done using Siamese network. You're right. Okay, but this is just works, right? So when you say uh, hashes or signature, it is like an embedding. Right, so it's pretty similar thing. I mean, I would not. Uh, so when you say CMEs, it needs to be trained for your data. But here, for duplicate, even if you take a pretend uh, network like ResNet, it will give you exact same embedding for the exact same content. Right, so no issues there. Yeah, Honesh. So, so Honesh, we'll talk about the concatenations and everything in the coming slides. Okay, that's a major section. We'll just take it up. So the deduplication happens over a certain period. Okay, so uh, it's a very valid question, Shita. So we cannot, you know, store months of data. So we have this rolling window on which we find the deduplication. So deduplication is uh, supervised and supervised. So there's no training. I mean, we just take features and you can say nearest neighbor. So it can be called as an unsupervised mechanism. Yeah. Uh, in scaling, uh, scaling Pratik, I think this you just check out uh, this uh, Milvers and Fires. So these are the tools for exactly this scaling part okay so it was not too hard to uh, do that so and we all use uh, google cloud platform so we have the scaling there inherent inbuilt so it's not a big deal to do that it's just a config changes okay? so that's not a major bottleneck for us right now so i'll quickly move to the next thing i mean so 
Yeah, I, I just to add a note that it seems that uh, your unique use case is about adding stuff and removing from this embedding database of Milverse or Fires because you want to work over a window. Is that right? So, so if you have to remove stuff from the previous window or you can just you just split the shards in such a way. Yeah. So the Milverse and these approaches, they're very they're fantastic in this. So they give you an option of spend, uh, you know setting up the time. So they will automatically, let's say, a stack will be there. It will be once something gets pushed. Queue will be there and we just pushed back out of the queue once new thing comes in. Yes. So, yeah. So, handle some of the yeah, yeah. So, so I think we try a lot to not reinvent the wheel. I mean, we could have written all of this ourselves, but it's just not probably worth it. I mean, these solutions are open source. You can use them and check whether they work or not. Unless you really need something new, you should probably try to use them as it is and then see what happens. Right. And uh, yeah, so this is an important topic. So as we mentioned earlier, we try to do AI feeds, right? So everything that you see comes through AI. So recommendation is a very important part. And what recommendation means is how to surface the content, right? What video to show is recommendation. And this becomes really, really difficult in the early part of the life cycle of a post. Okay. So you see that recommendation engines start working very well once enough people have seen the content, right? Then the recommendation knows that this person likes this, this one so like this. That is why I can show you that. But when you land on, let's say, Netflix for the first day, it is not able to recommend you anything. Because from user point of view, it's a cold start. They have not seen you seeing any video yet. So they will show you some popular things, right? So that is where we also face a lot of difficulty with the life cycle of a post. Right. So I'll just explain you here that with this example, that let's say there are two people, okay, both like pizza and salad. So the algorithm might have said they are similar person. But when let's say a new thing comes in, let's say this is Coke, then because the person in blue consumed Coke and the person on cycle in blue are similar, you can show this Coke to the person on cycle also. That is how recommendation works. It says if people are similar, one of it, if one of them, you know, consume something, the similar would also like to do that, right? But in order to do this, the person in blue has to consume this cold drink, right? If he would not have consumed, then we would not have known who to show this cold drink for, to, right? And that's what happens with our post. When a new post comes in, we do not know because it has not been shown to anybody. We do not know what kind of people will like it. Okay. So this is one major problem with recommendation engines. Okay. So they keep on improving as more consumption happens. In order to do that, what we do is we try to semantically understand the content. Okay. So instead of really, you know, uh, going through recommendation for early phase of a post, we try to semantically understand. So you can say one way of could be the classification. You just create some classes and then if somebody sees sports, you show them further videos of sports. That is one way. But this is very obvious thing that, you know, it's not about classes. I mean, maybe face identification can also help, right? So if you're seeing something from Virat Kohli, you might like to see more of it. Similarly, if you like some kind of songs and all, because songs represent some moods, right? So if you go to like a 1990 Bollywood song, then, you know, it's obvious that maybe if I show you something similar, you may like it, right? So <coughs> audio plays an important role. Similarly, you know, dance, forms, number of people, emotion, so, so it's not about classification. It is about holistically understanding the multimodal content. That is what we aim for at ShareChat, that we want to know everything about the video. We just don't want to know the classes. So one way is that, you know, you take all of these different lenses from which you can see data, right? Like genre, emotion, audio, video, and you fuse them all together and then train a classifier. So let's say I can have a classifier which says group dance, male dance, female dance, husband, wife romance, girlfriend, boyfriend romance. So just keep, you know, coming up with these categories. So we do this, honestly. So, so currently we do this because this is the first step to this holistic understanding of video because this is necessary. But then the problem that we're facing is how do we label this data? Like how many categories should take? Which categories? Because every day you see a video, it seems to be belonging to a new category. Just, you know, the, tech, the the way people do content is very, very wide. It's not some 50 things that people make. There are like maybe 5,000 things people make. And the more you analyze your content, it keeps on changing. And then we have this problem of long tail content. So a lot of this, you know, very specific content does not have videos. 
So you can imagine that making this classified is very, very difficult. So what we are trying to adapt is, we are trying to adapt this whole uh, direction of work, which is a cluster and classifier. So the idea here is that do not label the data, cluster the data. And when you cluster the data, it automatically tells you what are the common patterns in the data. Okay. And then you train for this cluster. Okay. So what happens here is that every cluster may not represent a manually understandable content, but it defines a one of the mode in the content. Okay. So this is the multiple papers here. I just put the first one here. But this is a very interesting field going ahead where, you know, your content is not very clearly defined. So you can. So, so just to summarize, that this is a this is a major unique use case that the, the, the output classes, the categories are, are the number of categories is huge. It keeps on changing. Plus there is long tail distribution. So yeah. all the you know, worst case reality problems. Uh, yeah. uh, right here, and and the approach that you have taken is to form these clusters and and classify based on them, rather yeah. than explicitly having these classes. Yeah. And uh, are you going to talk more about this, or yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, so 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 currently, what is in let's say equal production is the previous approach, where we took the categories to just understand the data, but this is something which is going on right now because we realize that we cannot go like that, right. So this is an ongoing effort wherein we would like our models to learn from the data themselves, train them, and then start recommending. The other interesting thing that we are carrying out is this one. This is also very unique. So all of this we are doing for recommendation, right? So why not predict if the post will be viral or not? So this is a very interesting new problem. I think a lot of people have looked at it from aesthetics point of view and other point of views, but you have to connect this to recommendation engine gradually. So if I can do this, then I don't need to understand anything. If I can just say, okay, this will be a viral post, put it on top, it's done, right? So, so we have these embeddings which are learned by the recommendation systems, and we are trying to align these two embeddings which are in different space, the content embedding, let's say ResNet feature, and the embedding from the recommendation system. So if you can find the right transformation, there are a high chance that you can take a content and predict whether it is going to be popular or not. So this is also part of the ongoing effort wherein the quality of the poll, the engagement is getting predicted. So we're finding it very difficult, honestly, because, uh, so because uh, virality is very, very vague, right? It's nothing about content. I mean, same content, if let's say a big actress does, it becomes viral. If same thing I make, it will not go viral. So it's not about the content. It's about a lot of factors and we are trying to identify what factors that could be. So this is a very, very unique share chat specific problem or recommendation specific problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, are there any open source virality predictors that actually work or papers where they have been successful? Yes, but these have been very, on, very generic things. So for example, people say that if there is a lot of motion, I mean, something nice is happening, right? So, so it's very dependent upon what kind of data is coming on your platform. So in our platform, a lot of people just stand and make videos. So it's not about motion anymore. <laughs> There's something else. I mean, so, so we don't know it yet. You guys, I mean, anybody would, I would love to hear suggestions like, why do you think a post becomes viral? And uh, it's very difficult. So one thing that we definitely realize is that it is something to do with creator. So if you take creator representation, because some creators are good, I mean, their post will get viral. But, but then what happens is they are anyway famous, right? So even if you don't do anything, they will anyway become good. But the problem is a new person who's making a very nice content how to help him, right? So it's easy to make Salman Khan movie hit, but you know, anybody, let's say Rajkumar Rao, I mean, if he finds it a little harder to get a hit movie, right? Because he has to, it has to come to the right platform so that people can see and appreciate it. Right? So, yeah. So there's a cold start problem. And then yeah. when you are already an influencer, you, you have, have a higher weight. Yeah. yeah. But are those features been talked about in any papers or? or yeah, yeah. So, so features are regarding, let's say, you can take the optical flow. The other could be, you know, if your optical flow is very expensive, then you can take a difference between two consecutive frames. And then, you know, some people say that if there are, if you cluster the data of a video, let's say cluster all the frames, and if you find too many clusters, then a lot of stuff is happening. Now, it all depends on your data whether a lot is good 
for a concentrated kind of video is good for you. It all depends on your platform, the data, and what kind of things become viral on your platform. Mm -hmm. So we are investigating yeah. this, yes. Right. So I think one example came up was that if I put a photo video in which fan is running, now it is high, it has very high optical flow, but no aesthetics, no virality factor. Mm -hmm. So can motion really say it? We don't know. I mean, yet. I mean, yet. it looks like uh, existing approaches are biased towards motion, and there are other features that could be used. Yeah, yeah. Or you just label the data. I mean. Just label that this became viral and just run a classifier or a regressor and so we are trying to. There, there are a couple of questions already, so maybe you can read through them or answer them when you want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rohit. So right, so when the, it comes to multiple languages, I think we are pretty uh, with we I mean the NLP social community is very, very advanced these days, right? With these uh, multi-model transformers, right? Multilingual transformers like Embert, Excel Embert, and people have trained for Indian languages also. So I would assume that this will not be an issue coming forward. Like once you have enough unsupervised data for all the languages, I am hoping that models will be fine. But, but they will make a mistake. When I say fine, it's not 100%. But I think still it should be the model should be able to handle it. And other thing that so we have not used it yet, but uh, we get to know the language of the video, okay? Because we know from where it is coming, what is the language setting in the mobile phone. So if really push comes to shop, we can also use that information to use the right model. Yes, and yeah, Rima. So uh, this is a very nice question. I mean, a lot very less people ask this. I mean, cluster and classify the cluster labels may change, right? So one thing is that uh, the paper shows it still works. So guys, what uh, Rima is asking, so what can happen is that all the dogs may go to cluster one in first iteration and in second iteration cluster two might become dogs right because clustering does not have this you know sense of permanence every time you cluster it will be new thing so how will model learn so one thing that paper shows is that even with this it works out okay and then there are follow-up work in this what they do is they also add a penalty so if the index changes from this to this they have a penalty there okay so so i so they call it like i think skip Horn or snip horn uh, thing from from uh, uh, Oxford VGG group. I think Andre Valdati group. They are doing a lot of work in this. So probably I'll after the session I'll share that paper with you. So this is a nice question and they have shown a nice elegant solution to it. Very very mathematical, but yeah, it can work. But even without that, people show that it works. It does mean virality? Yeah. So virality clicks, mm -hmm. views, reshares. Successful watches. I think these could be the ones. Uh, apart from that, I'm not sure. I mean, I should, so virality is pretty much depending on how many people are watching the video or completing the whole video. Okay, and then maybe yeah. So yeah. So I think now let's move to the cool part. I took a lot of time. I'll just move a little faster now. So so let us solution. So what we want? We want an accurate model, fast model, data efficient, and continual learning. Okay. So we want all of this. Right? Because the scale is high, the data cannot be labeled, as well as the trends are changing. So you want the model to be continually learned. Okay. So let's talk about the multi-model content. I think people asked this question earlier. So most of the video content has one visual component, audio, sometimes text, as well as other signals. Other signals are, as I mentioned, let's say who is creating the video. So in order to understand this video, you have to take care of all of these parameters. You cannot just take visual and understand it, right? For example, yeah, like a popular creator would not create IBC content. So in such situation, the signal of a creator is very important. <laughs> For example, like if you see this, the text is saying something else, the visual is something else. So if you only do text analysis, you may go wrong here. So you have to have a multimodal understanding of things. Similarly, you have to do temporal because video is temporal. So if you reverse the frame, shuffle the frame, you know, you guys pretty well understand, right? The videos have this problem of uh, ready to model temporal things. Similarly, for audio, you have to do it. For text, you have to do it. So you cannot just you know do frame level stuff here. You have to have temporal models. So you have to extract spatial temporal features, and then you have to fuse them in the right way, and then train it. Right. So we use like three D uh, convolution based networks. You can take like Resnex three D, three D CNN, I three D. There's a lot of things right now, and you can take whichever works for you. And then for feature extraction, we take a VGG kind of feature which you know works on the spectrogram of the audio, 
and give you some features from it. And for text, obviously, I'm able to try bird, fast text, stem bird, whatever, like whichever suits your thing. And uh, yeah, future is is very important for us. So once you have all the features, you have to fuse them. So we have we try a couple of strategy. One is early fusion, wherein you know you add all the things together in the initial state. Either add them or concatenate them and train the model. So what the advantage here is that you allow the model to, you know, model the relationship between the modalities. Okay, but the problem that happens is there are different dimension and scales at which modalities are. So maybe the audio is maybe in high values, but video might be very small in value. So if you don't take care, then early fusion hurts you. The late fusion is when you allow both the, all the modalities to train themselves, and then you combine their decision. So now the advantage here is that you are allowing each modality its own space. And but the problem here is that some modalities are very noisy for some kind of data. So in the first one, we are allowing the model to decide which is more important in some sense. In second one, we are giving everybody equal weightage. So what happens? There are pros and cons between these two approaches. So this diagram will be clear it a little bit. So on the left, we are seeing early fusion. So you took video, you took audio, text, represent it as some way, concatenate, and then train a classifier. On the right, you are seeing an example of late fusion, wherein you train classifiers for everybody separately, and then you do a fusion over it. So you can sum it. You can also add a linear layer here. That is what we do. We have a linear layer here, which kind of learns to combine the outputs of all the models all the modalities the other thing that we have we are trying right now is attention based fusion so if you see in bird you have this qva right so similarly here you can have a query value and tension kind of system that we are trying and the gating is another thing so there are few papers around better way of uh, you know combining the modality because whether you do early or whether you late you are doing late fusion in both you are sticking to a prior information right like you have induced a bias in your network already, so these things kind of help you in reducing the bias. Okay, so there are more smarter ways, and we are trying that. And uh, then another thing that we are trying to do is multitask training because uh, we all know, right? A lot of good papers are coming in multitask. So if I can do everything with the same model, it will also help me in production as well as it will also help the model to learn from other tasks also. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think now I'll hand over to Rishabh. I have already taken too much of time and uh, let's go further and deeper and we'll keep answering the questions as in they come. Okay, Rishabh, over to you. Yeah, thank you Vikram for this uh, introduction and it was uh, good, like mostly we have covered quite the good things here. Now, let's say we have trained accurate models. Now we the part comes, how can we deploy them? or the volume of posts that we are seeing each day, like it's uh, 4 million posts each day are being uploaded on ShareChat and March. So, so we, uh, yeah. let me just, yeah, so I think we are making a transition here. So Vikram covered a lot about how to encode those models and different modes are encoded differently, combined, fused in different ways. So yeah, yeah. are there any questions about that uh, audience? It's, it's, I mean, even though Vikram went, what's the word, I glided over it very smoothly, there are tremendous amount of details there. Each each of those, each mode deserves its own attention and then when you combine them, uh, maybe one question I have is that, do you actually, I mean, since uh, relating the text to a video is, is that you could have arbitrary text, you know, just... Uh, together with an arbitrary video, right? The, the one, like, you could have a man moving the box, but uh, the title below says lazy fox jumping over the water. Yeah. So, uh, so is there any interpretability to the system, the features that you have, that can you, uh, you know, when you match, for example, if you match sentences, you can match word by word and say that, okay, if these two things are similar, then the, some of the words would be similar. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in the context of having video and, and text, uh, uh, is there any sense of matching, intuitive sense of matching that you have or have developed or these systems are pretty much black boxes that you know get trained on huge amount of data and then they work thankfully, correct. 
Yeah. yeah, so I think it's an interesting question around explainability and that is one effort which has not honestly yet started here. So I think in next quarter that will be one of the major challenge. So right now we are, uh, you know, I mean, we're struggling to serve the users, the kind of content that we are getting. So uh, right now it's all focused on making the best possible models. And then maybe, you know, next quarter it will be around. So, so whenever we are seeing attention, I think a lot of us know this that once you have attention in your models, automatically some explainability kicks in, right? You will, so if you take word, you will be able to understand which word was given more importance. But visual models are uh, usually not that much. So we are also moving towards transformers now, right? So it's uh, top of the town. So I think that will also help us in getting to know which part of the video was seen for making a prediction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we, we're going that yeah. Okay, sounds good, yeah. So, Risha, please feel free to continue. Uh, there are uh, a bit, some more questions about how the fu fusion and yeah, we'll like, we take it up after this, uh, probably in after 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, sorry guys, uh, we have a bit relaxed uh, style of, 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 of these seminars and, and, and allow the audience to ask questions as well as the speakers to explain. So, the, the, the video will be available on YouTube on our channel, so you can also revisit it. And uh, yeah, feel free to stay back. Or, or I, I hope the speakers will, will will share some details if you want to ask more questions to them. Sounds good. Yeah, please, Risha. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, once we have developed these accurate models, now it's time to deploy these models. So many things we have to keep in consideration. First of all, being like there are four, more than 4 million posts being uploaded each day on both shared set and watch. So we have to process them at timely fashion. So for both the problems that uh, Vikram discussed earlier, the IVC detection and uh, cold start problem. So for IVC, we need to uh, detect any IVC content as soon as it has been created and published on the platform. Otherwise, it will it can become viral and um, uh, hinder. And, give good bad user experience and also for uh, recommendation once we have a new post we want to recommend it as soon as possible so um, there are multiple choices when we have to make once we have developed a model how to deploy it so say so like most of these feature extractors that we were uh, that we come was talking about are mostly uh, deep learning based and uh, gpus are the choice for that uh, choice to be used but uh, again we have to think about it like if we are using 10 cpus versus one gpu so we have to do cost comparison and if we can do uh, we can process 10 posts parallelly through 10 cpu machines which is cheaper as compared to one gpu machine it it, it is better to go uh, with cpus so those kind of trade offs have to be done for each model when we deploy them and also, um, apart from being, uh, apart from model being faster, there is another aspect of the overall system being efficient. So, uh, for video processing, uh, video model inference is one part, but the video decoding is another uh, important part. And what we have observed is sometimes it takes same amount of time on the machine as the uh, model inference part. So we try to optimize that as well. So these are the libraries Decoder and NVIDEC we use. So this performs decoding on GPU, which give us faster uh, decoding after that model inference is performed. Uh, one more important thing is like people are uploading uh, videos of large length as well, like two minutes, three minutes. And at the same time, the videos could have very high quality, like uh, HD quality videos. So it should not happen if we process any uh, video, it should not clog the pipeline because it is too heavy or has too many frames in it. So we subsample the video to fix number of frames. After that, by selecting some keyframes, after them, after that, uh, we perform uh, spatial resampling to resize them to a fixed dimension, then feed into our networks to get a consistent th throughput across the uh, system. So yeah, this diagram shows the decoding part of videos. So let's say if we consider OpenCV as the baseline version, this decode gives um, 2.3, uh, approximately 2.3 times more faster uh, decodes of video in sequential rate, as well as in training, it gives six times more uh, uh, speed up than the OpenCV version. So decode uh, is important and we use these uh, libraries like decode to do 
faster decodes of the video. So for keyframe extraction, the, this is the general framework that we use. So for any, any given input video, we first um, remove the low quality frame. So this is a standard algorithm that is used uh, named Hecate for multiple at multiple places to uh, extract non blurry uh, distinct frames. So that can represent the whole video. So once keyframe extraction is done, so, uh, we can perform any other things like OCR is one of the important things where we have to extract text from uh, which is embedded on the image. So we can't do complete on all the frames of the video. So we first extract keyframes and uh, do OCR on top of that. Also, we use uh, these frames for some of the other tasks like IVC detection. So, yeah, so now once we have uh, the system ready, we, we have to make design choices for the model architecture. What kind of architectures do we want to explore such that they are efficient yet accurate? Um, so in this chart, we can see there, uh, this diagram shows the top one image net accuracy versus the number of flops. So these, there are multiple model architectures. You can see like uh, squeeze and excitation blocks and mobile net. These kind of architectures are uh, very efficient as they come as they have very low computations but have high accuracy on the other hand vgg and other sorry vgg uh, set of networks uh, have high number of flops but uh, lower accuracies so these choices we make before starting any of these uh, model requirements so yeah so on the on respect to video so videos have spatial as well as temporal information present right so uh, given uh, any 2D image CNN, uh, sorry, any 2D CNN architecture, we we can use them for videos by extracting keyframes and passing each of these keyframe uh, to 2D CNN, finally fusing the outputs. But uh, the uh, main information in temporal dimension is being lost in uh, creating a video such way. So 3D CNNs are the way to go, where they model both the spatial and temporal information together. And uh, the, uh, this in practice performs really well then using only 2D convolution. But at the same time, we can see uh, these 3D filters have three dimensions and have a lot many more parameters for the same number of inputs and output channels. So 3D convolutions are good, but they are uh, compute heavy and also consume a lot of memory on the model size. So th uh, there are some innovative methods like temporal shift modules that try to um, induce this uh, temporal rel relationship into 2D networks only. So in this diagram, we can see there are three, let the, let's say these are three frames from a given video and these, uh, and we are passing uh, all of these frames through uh, a 2D CNN network. So one way is to just pass through them and finally fuse the features at the final prediction. But here, what they try to do is after each layer of convolution, they shift the features from um, the frame with time point t to the frame with time point t plus one. So here we can see the features are being shifted in the red color we can see. So it gives some, and for next layer, it will have information from um, this time point as well as from the previous time point. So it gives, uh, uh, it provides information of the previous. So one could do other way also, like taking the information from the next time point as well. And this uh, works really well. Like. And um, so it is able to model the temporal information as well. So this gives a lot of boost as compared to 2D CNN. At the same time, this is very efficient as well. Like we only have to do one shift operation, uh, which is not very uh, heavy as compared to the standard 2D CNNs. So yeah. So yeah, once we have the, selected the model architecture that we want to work on and train the model architecture for our uh, task. Now, one way is to prune the network or compress the network once it is being trained. So there are approaches like network pruning and weight quantization where we can compress that already trained network and use it for deployment. So in uh, network pruning, what can what we can do is we uh, so given a so for instance here we have a fully connected network, we can remove some connections which are not important for the final predictions as well as we can remove the neurons that. Uh, they don't have, they don't capture much of the information from the input. Um, so network pruning reduces the 
model size as well as increases the overall uh, inference time of the network. Also, on uh, so we can perform weight quantization where we can uh, reduce the precision of each weight. So generally, the uh, weights of the network are uh, stored in floating point 32. We can reduce it to int 8 or something like that by quantizing them and using them uh, for the deployment. But uh, like we can see, we are lo losing a lot of information by doing pruning and quantization. So accuracy may drop. So for that part, uh, the model is retrained and again pruned. So this is an iterative process. And after that, finally, we'll get to, hopefully we'll get a model which is kind of having similar accuracy, but the model size is reduced by a lot. So yeah, uh, so another approach is knowledge distillation um, for model compression. So these three techniques can be used together as well and each try to optimize for a different thing for compressing the network. So ideally pruning quantization and knowledge distillation should be used together to get the best out of all the words. And uh, so the idea of distillation is to train a very heavy large network and distill the knowledge from the larger network to the smaller network. And uh, yeah, so uh, so one more point here, like pruning and quantization has to be um, done on the same network once the network is trained. But for knowledge distillation, we can use completely different network to distill the knowledge from a larger network to a smaller network. So yeah, so the idea of knowledge distillation is like um, comes from nature. So um, so like many insects have two forms. One form is larva form that, that is optimized for extracting energy and nutrients from environment and another form which is optimized for travel and other purposes. So the idea is to have two networks. One is a very cumbersome network that tries to extract the uh, structure from the data and another small network that is optimized for faster inference. So once we have trained the cumbersome network, we will try to train the smaller network with the help of this larger network. Uh, through the technique called distillation. And finally, we will use this smaller network for deployment. <coughs> so yeah, the basic idea of knowledge distillation is, so we have two network. One is a larger teacher network. So it has high capacity. So by larger, I mean it has a lot many layers. And uh, as it has a lot many layers, it can uh, explore the search space, parameter search space well. And it can have very, it will have very high accuracy trained for long enough time. And uh, there is a smaller uh, lim network, student network, which has very low capacity. And um, if we train separately the teacher network and student network, the student network doesn't have uh, that much para uh, that much capacity to learn uh, very complex functions. So what we'll do is uh, in um, knowledge distillation, what is done is, so for this teacher network, we will train it for a uh, very long time with large amount of data. So teacher, teacher, sorry, teacher network can be um, as complex as you want. So we can have, we can train it on multiple GPUs and whatever, because finally we have to deploy only the student network. So the prime first goal is to train the teacher network as well as we can. So once we train the teacher network, we try to impart this learned knowledge to the student network. And finally, once the student network is trained, it is deployed uh, uh, on the uh, uh, machine over. So the student network, uh, ideally the student network uh, should have more accuracy as compared to training it directly with the, in a supervised fashion without any teacher. And it is proved in practice, like it uh, has, uh, it gets some boost by uh, training in a knowledge distillation fashion. So yeah, this is the um, uh, steps that we have to follow for knowledge distillation. First, first we will train a teacher model with labeled data. This can be large amount of data as well. And after that, we will uh, freeze the teacher model, freeze the weights of the teacher model, and train the student model with two losses. One loss would be the from the ground truth prediction. So how? Uh, so uh, one loss would be taking the consistency with the ground rules and another would be would be consistent you know, taking the consistency with the teacher's prediction. So for training the student model, we can have the same training set as that of the teacher or we can have a different uh, training set, which is called transfer set. So this transfer set could be smaller than the actual size of the 
uh, training set that we use to train the teacher. So, yeah, so uh, how does uh, training with teacher help the network? So, so the predictions of teachers are given by the softmax formula, where ZA are the logics and uh, T is the uh, temperature term. Okay, and so the prediction of teachers are called soft targets as it is, as it has probability of each of the class, each of the classes from the let's say for classification task. And this temperature parameter controls how smooth is the probability distribution among these classes. So if we have very small, uh, let's say t equals to one, which is a standard um, temperature value that is used to train these networks. So it, we can see it is very peaky for class two. We have very high probabilities for other class. It is very low. And if we increase the temperature value to large values, it, it gives us smoother distribution over the class probabilities. So. Yeah. So yeah, so um, I, we have we already have ground truths to train with. Now, how does this teacher prediction helps us in training? So in the first row, we can see th there is this one hot encoded output with where uh, for a classification task among four categories: dog, cat, car, and truck. And dog has uh, uh, the image has the label dog. So for one hit, one hot encoded vector, we can see. And dog is given uh, one and others are zero and there is no information across the classes right so there is no information present how is dog related to cat and how is car related to record thing like that but once we have trained the teacher network it has learned to um, gather information among the class similarities as well so in second row we can see uh, so second row represents the prediction from a well-trained teacher network where we have 0.6 and 0.3 for dog and cat respectively and 0.02 and 0.08 for car and truck. So here we can see like uh, uh, dog looks very much like it, it looks similar to cat and hence the probabilities are also quite high. On the other hand, car and truck, so, so given the ground truth image of dog, car and truck are very less likely and they have some kind of relation. So this kind of information is not present in one hot encoded uh, vectors. So training the student model with additional soft labels like these help help him uh, learn the help it learn the knowledge of this uh, class similarities among them. And finally, um, in the third row, we can see this is the teacher network which is not trained appropriately. So here we can see the uh, dog and car have high probabilities for a ground truth image of uh, dog. So using such a teacher network could even uh, reduce the performance of the uh, student network. So the idea is to first train the teacher network really well. After that, we can use it to perform distillation on the, the student model. So, um, so, so you mean that the actual labels help instead of the teacher to help the student instead? Of, if it was just the teacher who was helping the student, then student would have failed at dog versus cat, but is the actual labels that help student be more correct? Is that is that what you? Right, right, right. So yeah, only uh, so if we have only the ground truth labels, then the model will not the student will not learn directly from the ground truth because although it will learn this is a dog class, but it will not learn similarities among the dog and cat, cat or any other classes. But if we have this additional information of soft labels one, wherein we, uh, we have, we got to know dog and cat are more likely for this picture. So it will learn some like dog and cat have similar features and they will have four legs and so on. Mm -hmm. So this kind of information is imparted from the teacher to student. Okay. So yeah, in principle, this teacher network could be anything like uh, it can be a very bigger network. It can be ensemble of various networks or it can be a completely different architecture as well. So what we did for IVC detection is, um, as we have discussed earlier, 3D models perform really well. So we trained a ResNex 3D network with uh, 101 layers, which, uh, which is a very heavy network uh, to be deployed for uh, this task. So once we trained this 3D network and uh, con uh, with uh, for the whole video and considered it as a teacher to train a smaller student network, then the student network was just simply frame-based model. So this frame-based model doesn't have much of temporal information uh, in place. So it will try to learn this information through the 
um, learnings of the teacher network. So by training through this approach, we got a lot of gains uh, on the frame-based models. And this frame-based model was finally de deployed in production. Okay, I think uh, we can take some questions here. So there are a couple of questions about quantization aware training, knowledge distillation with multiple languages. Uh, I think there was a question earlier about how much metric gains do you get expect from unimodal to multimodal? Okay, yeah. So about unimodal multimodal, probably I'll take it. So uh, from the classification task, we see around eight to ten percent improvement by taking audio. Okay, because what happens is that the kind of content that we get, the audio plays a very very important role. So if you are let's say making a funny video. Then there are some very peculiar, you know, laughing sounds and background sounds that play around. So maybe visual something else might be happening, but this sound will be very important. Hmm. So is this is a leading mode? I, I, I'm assuming the answer would be no. Meaning that if you always take that mode, you'll be you know 60-70% right. Video versus audio, is it like that? In, no, so it does not happen that often, but yeah, video plays more important role than audio. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and uh, do you have an ontology for the classes? Yeah, yeah, we have. We have an ontology, and we are trying to gradually build up that. So we, <coughs> so theoretically, we have everything now, but then we have to collect data for each of this label data. So we have this whole understanding of a tree, which shows how our content actually is there on the platform. And you, you guys have come up with that ontology from scratch based on the data that you've seen. Yes, yes, yes. So let's say a comedy is there, then it can be let's say a comedy by a male, by a female, by a group. So that way we can drill down as we depend, depending upon how much fine we want to go there. And do, do you have to, well, my question was, do you have to restart the ontology building anytime? Or throw away a part of the tree and okay, yeah. Let's, let's. yeah, we we have to we have to because uh, since the content is ever evolving, what might happen after a certain time is you realize oh man I mean this could also have happened, right? So let's say today I mean let's say in comedy you will not see devotional posts, but maybe in future if that comes in, then you have to break the tree and you have to reattach the branches accordingly. So it will keep on changing, I guess. I see. And then there are a couple of questions about distillation. Have you about uh, quantization aware training? Have you tried that? Uh, knowledge distillation versus directly training the student model. Uh, that's one way. And maybe I can also add distillation versus pruning and quantization. So if you didn't do pruning quantization and just did distillation versus what will happen. So a couple of questions for you, Rishabh. Please answer them as. Yeah, right. So um, in principle, um, Distillation is different than pruning and weight quantization, and these can be used together. We started with distillation as it is a first step to decide on the architecture and try to get maximum accuracy on the student network. After that, we can uh, try um, pruning quantization. Also, uh, we haven't explored the area of quantization away training, but it is in the future steps. So once we have trained the student model correctly, we'll try to train with the uh, quantization away training. Uh, so, and on the other part, um, so the student model ob uh, obviously performs better than the supervised training of uh, without teacher that we have observed and we have uh, achieved 7 to 8% gains in um, recall on this IVC detection. And um, another question, sorry, uh, Nishant, you were saying the last question I uh, I forgot the order in which I was asking. Uh, so, so it was your question. Yeah, yeah. it was about knowledge distillation versus pruning and versus pruning quantization. If you didn't do distillation, only did pruning quantization, you would manage to reduce the size of it of the model still, right? And yeah, yeah, accuracy right. is it changing. Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple of uh, trade-offs here: accuracy, keeping the retaining the accuracy, retaining or reducing the size. Uh, to the maximum so so i'm trying to just get a overview of that space of you did one versus others right 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 so um, like i said um, um, these uh, pruning and quantization aware training could be done just after distillation as well 
uh, we have compressed the network. So there are two choices. One is the architecture choice that we have to take uh, during the distillation. What is the student network we want to get? For that particular architecture, we are trying to maximize the juice and get the highest accuracy possible through distillation, uh, more than supervised training. Once that is done, we can perform quantization aware training or pruning to uh, uh, make that architecture more lightweight or sparser. So, so it sounds like you're keeping those things orthogonal. You're first focusing on accuracy and then right. on compress. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And just to add to it, I, how I see distillation is very different from quantization and pruning because when you do quantization pruning, if you're starting from, let's say, a 100 layer network and your pruning factor is 10%, then you can only go till 90. What distillation allows you to do it, go to 10 maybe directly because you can train a transformer from a LSTM or vice versa, right? So we feel that this is much stronger concept than pruning and quantization. I mean, you can anyway do pruning quantization, but it will only give you first a drop in accuracy and relative change in the model size. But distillation can completely kill it off. I mean, it can just drop all the way. Yeah. Much yeah. harder. So, so then, then the, yeah, so the way, another way to put it is that is distillation enough in itself? After distillation, maybe you don't need at least pruning. Uh, you yeah. can just go down to the smaller model. Does yeah. that hold in practice or not? So I think uh, pruning will always give you some speed up, some, speed. some drop. So it will never be that pruning will not stop working. But it just depends how much you know throughput you want. And if distillation can give you that, it's fine. Otherwise, you can further go down. And did we miss any question? There's a question about uh, coming up with neural processing unit or specialized accelerators for maybe video or have you considered that as just the normal GPUs with the uh, with the particular decoder that you're using? That, yeah. that is good enough. I think for training that is good enough. And uh, one of our team is also working on on device models right now. So they would be focusing more on using the power of the smartphones. Yeah. Then at the I think. Uh, Last question is how much role product managers play in defining these ontologies? A lot, <laughs> a lot. I mean, <laughs> I mean, so they do it the most of the hard work here. I think most of the grunt work is done by them. I mean, they will say do all the SQL inquiries and all to understand what are the videos, what are the types, right? So they play a very important role, and they also play a very important role in defining which one to take first, right? So if you have your tree has let's say thousand of leaves, you cannot go all thousand all guns blazing, right? I mean, you cannot collect that much data. You don't even know what you need. So our product managers tell us, you know, these are the important things. If you do good here, we will be able to improve the, uh, and let's say the matrix in a better way. And product managers drive a lot around these kind of choices. Uh, yeah, I hope we've covered all the questions. If if you are in the audience still and we have missed your question, please. Uh, yeah, raise your hand or type your questions again. Yeah. So uh, I think I will start now. Yes, please. Yeah, so another important part is uh, having data efficient model. So we have done accurate, we have done lightweight. Now, what about the data and how can we use unlabeled data specifically? So, um, to train these models very accurately, uh, we need large amount of labeled data. And uh, on ShareChat and mods, like, like I mentioned, there are more millions of posts uploaded each day. So it is not possible to manually annotate each of these data points. And also for some of the data type, the annotation is very difficult or time consuming. For instance, if one has to annotate what category for this video is, let's say half is singing and half is dancing, it takes time to uh, and some judgment to give it a uh, correct label. So um, again, uh, pointing on the same uh, thing, manual curation is kind of uh, very difficult. So by manual curation, I mean like, let's say we have to train a classifier. Now we have to, um, for each of the classes, we need uh, some number of data samples, right? And uh, manually selecting these data points without uh, reviewing is uh, kind of impossible. So random, one could do a random sampling of all the data and then um, assign these class labels 
but random sampling will miss most of the class some of the classes which are very specific to that category or it could also miss some of the very rare categories as well so uh, and also if we do random sampling there is this class imbalance problem for instance this ivc content is less than 1% of the overall data of the platform so if we just randomly sample x amount of data then we have very huge class imbalance to train with, uh, to start with training the network and also for uh, cold start problem as well there are some long tailed classes or uh, uh, long tailed classes which have very less data points so random sampling could again miss those data points and um, manual annotation again is uh, costly and difficult and also uh, we have to train the moderate uh, annotators regularly to get very accurate lab accurate labels so for instance for ivc detection we have multiple of uh, fine grain categories such as gore violence and um and it's a nudity uh, added or uh, suggestive nudity all these kind of things clickbait spams so it requires training to them like uh, what is one kind of post and what is another kind of post and uh, it is sometimes very confusing even to us like which one which category does this data belongs to so yeah uh, so all in all this creating label data is very challenging uh, at this scale so uh, so we try to use unlabeled data so as we have lot lot of posts uploaded we have lot of unlabeled data right and can we use these to train our models so we leverage semi supervised learning which is kind of combination of supervised and unsupervised learning and uh, which basically in semi supervised learning what is done is we use small amount of labeled data along with large amounts of unlabeled data and try to build a model using both the labeled and unlabeled data and so the idea is to leverage the structure present in the unlabeled data and their relationships among themselves so for all the semi supervised uh, most common semi supervised uh, techniques there are three concepts that is used that are used uh, first is induction so induction is given x and y pairs uh, you will try to approximate a function that uh, justify these x and y mappings uh, another one is deduction so given this function how can you uh, Uh, create new mappings for a given set of inputs and finally a transduction so given x and y mapping you don't know the function you don't even try to approximate the function you will just give the labels to the new set of data points so this gives uh, um um so this starts with uh, two semi supervised uh, learning approaches which is which are primary uh for any um, unlabeled data training first is transductive learning in which like i mentioned transduction is used where we have x comma y pairs and we'll just give labels to the new set of x uh, x data input so um for this first a similarity graph is created between the data points so using some kind of representation for each of the data point we compute the similarity between them and create the similarity graph and once the similarity graph is created we predict we predict labels for any new data point based on its neighbors and what how uh, uh, at how much distance those particular data points are there in the tree presentation space so here we are yes yeah. uh, so here we are not training any model directly we, we just take kind of nearest neighbor first compute the graph and assign predict the labels for unlabeled data points yeah. another one was uh, inductive learning where we first train the model on the labeled data and use the learned model to predict on the unlabeled data so the uh, so here we have trained a classifier uh, with in a supervised fashion on the small amount of labeled data once it is trained we'll use it to give pseudo labels to the unlabeled data and repeat this process over and over to retrain the model with uh, combination of labeled as well as the unlabeled Uh, but yeah like uh, from inductive learning it looks easy to just directly like it looks like we have solved the un, uh, unlabeled data problem and it it should work always but that is not the case like it depends on the quantity and the quality of the labeled data you have so those label samples although they are very less it should cover the uh, uh, cover most of the case the uh, real world example if that is not the case even the pseudo labels will be wrong 
so for instance so if we if we have labeled data where we have only two kind of examples uh, green grapes and uh, blackberries uh, so uh, if we have trained with this labeled data and assigned pseudo labels to all the data set finally the testing side when we get uh, this uh, black grapes image we will predict it as blackberries because we haven't seen this and even the pseudo labels uh, were of either berries or uh, green grapes also here we can see the prediction would be much more confident as well so it can give confident predictions uh, but those will be wrong so uh, one has to take care of things before training a semi supervised uh, network so uh, yeah so I approaches could be uh, like an induction inductive semi supervised learning we have mentioned there is one model that first uh, assigns the pseudo label so the pseudo label assignment can be done in other ways as well we can train ensemble of models as ensemble of models are uh, have shown great improvement in performance in classification and other tasks one can use ensemble to assign pseudo labels and finally those labels can be used for uh, retraining the model now again if we use ensemble we it is computationally heavy like we have to train multiple models with the same data set and so on and so forth so what we can do is we can this is this idea of uh, temporal assembling wherein we train a network for uh, for let's say k epochs and we take um, we consider each of uh, the model from each of these uh, model trained just after each of these epochs as a separate model and we can take ensemble of the predictions of uh, these models so we can take uh, a predict we can predict from the checkpoint from mod, uh, epoch 1 checkpoint from epoch 2 and so on and take a combination of uh, to get a final pseudo label but uh, here like uh, in starting the network might not have learned very well so we can use exponential moving average of the predictions to assign a final label where the recent uh, checkpoints are given more weightage okay so um, like we have seen uh, we we could perform this uh, temporal assembly but the problem there is uh, we have to train for one epoch after that we will assign pseudo labels again we will train again we will uh, assign pseudo labels so for uh, to get the information of pseudo labels used in the training one has to wait for the complete epoch so the, in such a way um, so that the model has to wait once the epoch is complete after then it will get new set of labels maybe it could have realized in half way only like these labels are improved and we have new labels but still it has to wait till the epoch end and to assign the new labels so in this way the information is uh, passed very slowly in the uh, in the main our learning model so what we could try to do is we could try to update these labels uh, regularly within within each epoch as well but that is a bit difficult to we have to do one forward pass for all the data points in uh, midpoint of the training uh, or at any point of the training in a single epoch so there was this idea of mean teacher what try, what it tries to do is instead of taking the um ensembling of the previous checkpoints of the prediction it takes uh, uh, ensemble it does ensemble the model weights of all the previous iterations so instead of taking um, average of the predictions we'll take uh, average of the model weights to uh, create a new model which is the teacher model so this teacher model will be used to assign a label and like we can say uh, say in each epoch we are having multiple iterations based on the batches whatever you have you can keep on updating the weights of this teacher model as the exponential moving average of the weights of all the previous iterations in this way what can happen is so within one uh, epoch only we can update the weights uh, of the uh, teacher or basically the assigning network and also it can give uh, it can change the labels of the prediction so yeah though finally the student model is trained with two losses one is consistency loss and another is uh, the standard cross entropy so the consistency loss is between the prediction of the pseudo label which is the teacher predicted and the uh, prediction from the um, base student network and the cross entropy is between again the ground truth and the predicted label so we can see like for unlabeled data we don't have ground truth label so we will only use 
consistency loss between the teacher's prediction and the student prediction. The student prediction will try to mimic the teacher prediction. So yeah. Uh, so this is the overall uh, architecture diagram. We are given any input set of features. The teacher model is, uh, there's a teacher model and a student model. The teacher model weights are updated regularly after K epochs by the moving average of uh, um, the student weights. And the student model is trained with the gradients back propagate back propagating from these two loss functions. So we have two loss functions, one is with the ground truth cross entropy, and another with the teacher's prediction, which is consistency between the teachers and the students. So the teacher predictions are here pseudo labels like that we had earlier. So this is an ongoing process. We we don't have two steps of assigning first assigning the pseudo labels then training. The pseudo labels are directly incorporated in this uh, single training mechanism. So we can compute the loss with that. Yeah, so it seems, uh, sorry, if you can go back, it seems yeah. to have a lot of moving parts here, you know, pick which of the epochs or sub iterations of the teacher model to ensemble and predict the next, uh, pick the pseudo labels, train the student model, maybe observe its performance and then, I don't know, you're going to give feedback to the teacher also? Or, or am, am I jumping to that? Um, so let me repeat the question. Yeah. So, so uh, you, I think it will be good to know which of the teacher iterations are going to give me a, a good model, good predictions for the pseudo label, right? Um, if we are doing it on the fly, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, it seems to me that there are too many moving parts, too much randomness. We, we are relying on randomness to give us good pseudo labels or is you're making it more is there a way to make it more deterministic yeah i'm not sure my question was very clear but yeah if you can still answer it yeah right, right. so uh, the basic idea is like let's say if we have only the labeled data points we don't have any unlabeled data points and the student is trained with just uh, uh whatever your cross entropy loss right and the teacher model is just an ensemble of all the previous models, previous versions of the student model. Okay. So ideally it, it should perform, it should give more confident or more good predictions than the student model. This is one uh, step one. And we could directly use the predictions of student only to give the pseudo labels that is done in the standard inductive learning. But uh, um, as we know, like ensembles perform better we take ensembles of the previous iterations of the student model. Now, the, st uh, the idea is to, one way is to just uh, have this teacher model as the en uh, ensemble of the previous student model. And let's assign it pseudo label. We can use it to retrain the model. Again, let after each epoch, let it assign the pseudo labels and do subsequently. But for this, we have to wait for one epoch to get good pseudo labels, sure. right? So instead of doing that, uh, what we can do is we can have this teacher model um, incorporated directly within each epoch so instead of an epoch we'll consider each iteration as a new one mm -hmm. right and uh, we keep on updating the pseudo labels predicted by the teacher so basically here we explicitly we don't want to assign pseudo labels those are directly incorporated with this loss computing with the student prediction and teacher prediction nice so so, so the first strategy was to have explicit checkpoints across student models. If you think that that is uh, very slow. So, so just have one iteration of training of both teacher and student in parallel, where teacher keeps on generating these two, these proxy labels, uh, and, and student keeps on uh, learning through them. There seems to be some something still missing, but it, it, oh, what, what I said was roughly correct. Or, yeah. Sushant, I think yeah, one thing is missing here is that in this, uh, so the one which is slow in that epochs have to be complete because there for every sample, you need the output from different epochs. Mm -hmm. But here you do not need to do it. So instead of making it a sample, uh, sample, sample as the pivot point, here they have made the model as the pivot point. So they say that instead of waiting for each sample to get multiple predictions, mm -hmm. let's add something in the model itself, right? Because in the previous one, what you were doing was FX sure. 
plus yeah. alpha of fx2 plus alpha of fx3. Here, what you are doing is you keep the x like that, change the f only. So it is f1, f2, f3 now. So whether you do a function level or you do at the input level, so just a different way of looking at it. This way of looking at it makes it easy because the epochs don't have to complete. And the problem is that with current data sets, nobody runs more epochs now, right? It's all about iterations these days. Mm -hmm. People run just three epochs, but data is so huge. So you never get to see maybe the same sample again also at times. So that's yeah. where the idea approach was not practical in current scenario. This has become practical. One more point I want to make here is that the teacher is not trained at all. The gradient never flows to teacher. After some epochs, teacher is just updated with the parameters of the student. So this is not moving part. So teacher is not the moving part here. Teacher is just a storage space for storing, let's say, the student multiple epochs in, in a weight sense. Right? Yeah, so that's a, that's a yeah, important clarification, yes. But uh, uh, so, teacher is sort of a storage point of of the previous uh, student models. Yeah. But then uh, that is the slow mode of working. In the in the fast mode that you are talking about, this is, this is the fast mode. Because here every batch the teacher keeps on can, can be can be changed. If I see. I see. Okay. So 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 maybe that that is invariant throughout. The teacher is never updated directly. It's always updated from the student model at that iteration. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes. That yeah. So there's no gradient flow in teacher. If you see I that see. diagram, it's just in student. Yeah. And one more point maybe I'll have to make that both these have higher dropouts and a lot of augmentation. So you never feed the same image. If you feed the same image, then maybe nothing will happen. So both the uh, you know the ensemble, which is teacher, sees let's say a rotated image, and the student will see, let's say, a translated image, and they will be expected to come up with this representation. So there's a lot of data augmentation which is going on to learn the concept well. Sounds very good. Yeah, great clarification. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please. I think our audience has a few questions also. Yeah. Maybe we just finish it in one two minutes. Risha, we can skip the continual part maybe. And then we'll take questions. I think that is more important probably. Yeah, sure, sure. So yeah, all in all, this uh, semi-supervised training gives us large improvements on uh, IVC detection, and it provides another way to uh, start training the models, even we, if we have very less data samples labeled. We'll skip this part for now. I think let's uh, go to the questions. I think that's much better use of everybody's time. I think. Or maybe you could just say a few words about that slide and not get into detail. Okay. Sure. What you skipped. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, the main idea of continual learning is like in all of our models, the data keeps on changing. And for specifically for IVC content, the uh, creator finds new ways to fool the system such that which is passed by the network. And another is this um, for code start as well, like new kind of content is being uploaded every time and the genres change very rapidly. So this ontology also changes. So it requires multiple rounds of retraining uh, of the models. So uh, we have we, we have set up some continual learning pipeline where these networks keep on training after one week or so based on the uh, uh, data distribution change. And there are some evaluation strategies. If the accuracy drops, then we do retraining. Otherwise, we don't. And all the all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. So yeah, the um, yeah, Vikram, you can. Yeah, so I think, guys. I mean, like in future plans, if I say the problem properties is uh, straightforward for us, these are the most important ones. We want to make the best in class recommendation system, and especially we want to work, make it work good at early phase of the post. That is where a lot of value lies for us. Similarly, we want to improve the IVC detection because whatever we do, there are new ways to pull the system. So we're also trying some kind of keyword spotting in audio domain now, like ASR. So if there are, let's say, some abusive words in the audio, can we directly detect it? So that could also be another dimension to the whole IVC detection. And self-supervised and unsupervised will be probably one of the major themes going ahead in this year. Because if we fix the data part, I think rest all is figured out. I mean, the data is the major, major model, like not the models these days. And then model comparison is important. I mean, the, this 2 million is going to get to 4 million and 6 million and so on and so forth. So this will be a very important challenge going ahead. I mean, 2 million is still easy, I think. 
and then the data drift. So this kind of platform evolves, right? And uh, once it is evolving, your model should evolve. So, so these are the common themes which are going ahead in our team these days, and we are every day trying new models, new mechanisms, improving the earlier ones to be on the track. So yeah, so with that, just like say thank you everyone for attending. I mean, it has been a little longer session, too many slides, but hopefully, I mean, there are some take back messages for everyone to just you know like read and some good uh, ideas you might have got. Let's be open for questions. Yeah, thank you again, uh, Vikram and Dishab. This is, I mean, uh, this was both deep and wide talk, and, and we're very happy that you could. You guys could take time to, to uh, the content and to answer the questions. Yeah, uh, and, and thank you. thanks to the audience too. There are a couple of questions, and, and I guess, uh, uh, yeah, Vikram, Madhusha, we can look at yeah. last few. Okay, so is there any <coughs> rate of inflection point? Yeah, I so I think it's still very difficult to say. I mean, this pseudo label accuracy. I mean, it will depend on the data set, the problem. So I don't think we read a lot of paper, but nobody has an inflection point value. It's very subjective. So, but yeah, I mean, so we'll write a few blogs later once you know we get that some values for some of the use cases. But it will keep on changing depending upon use case and how much gain. Yeah, so I think we got a lot of gain. So it's uh, about. Uh, Harishab, uh, what was the percentage for mean teacher method and how much gain did we get? Yeah, approximately it was 10% on the recall yeah. values. Yeah, so that's pretty huge for us, for the setting. Um, and then uh, abundance of semester. Yeah, so I should think we can connect offline also on this. So there are a lot of approaches. I mean, we have just tried to cover one of it. Like, let's say the, what we call a seminal work and one thing. And there are more things like so. Uh, so we are trying adversarial training, virtual adversarial training, which did not work so well for us. So there are some failure cases which don't work, and the same technique may not work at multiple bases. So it's not that mean teacher, you know, put everywhere and it starts working, because that problem has to be there first, right? If the task is easy, then maybe the original student model is able to capture everything, and teacher may not. Help. So it's very dependent upon the problem statement and data. Uh, regarding the data size, everybody again, I mean, it's very subjective. IBC has different data size topic. That cold start has different, so everybody has different data sets, but they are big in number. If that is what you meant, so they're not they're not using small data. Like for uh, cold start, we have around uh, 500k videos, so it's pretty huge. It's not small. And uh, you may ask me, is any cluster cluster approach for your textual data? So remember, so this uh, cluster cluster approach is independent of the modality. And if you want to see, you can see this paper XDC. So XDC will kind of take audio and video into consideration. So I'm not sure if they take text also, but there are multi-model cluster and classify algorithms also. But if you can imagine, I mean, like these days it's all becoming very uniform. Like once you have the bot embeddings, it's as good as that, right? I mean, like then all the processing remain can be same as before. So I think with this changes, you can apply this into other. Is share chat hiring? Of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, we are hiring, we are expanding. Yeah. Maybe I should ask Abhishek, are you applying? <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. I mean, it's great that you guys were to share uh, so much uh, you know, about the problem and the audience got to learn. Otherwise, uh, a lot of it just stays behind the door. And people don't learn how what they read in these papers and archive every other day. Uh, how, how, how is all of that applied to real life? Thank you, everybody. Yeah, it was great. Are there any other questions or comments that the users have? Yeah, I mean, thumbs up definitely helps us. So, yeah, yeah, we can uh, the talk. As I said, the talk will be available on the YouTube channel as well as you know older talks you can go and watch. And if you have any questions, Vikram or Risha, would you like to leave any contact or, um, or there, there's a event page uh, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, if you guys have any question, please feel free yeah. to, to write there and, and, uh, and we'll connect you to the, to, you can answer these questions. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Nishan, for having us. It was really nice. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this yeah. Yeah. super long session. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, then this will be you know there in made permanent in, on on the YouTube channel also, so you can come back and yeah, <laughs> just look at the how many questions we answered. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much for yeah. Thank you. Sharing your thank you. Bye, guys. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. I'll be closing the session. Bye.